good afternoon. My name is Stephen Capaldo, Ecad Unity Ministries, North Providence, Rhode Island. Thank you for tuning in uh, this afternoon. It's June 29th, 2015. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a topic called Choosing Life. Uh, it's based on the scripture of Deuteronomy 30, 19 to 20, and we'll have a few other scriptures that go with it. And we'll try just to get some basic principles, a basic definition of what it means when you choose life. If you choose life, it means you don't choose something else. It means you don't choose death. Before we do that, we'll uh, begin with a moment of prayer. And Father, we'd just like to thank you once again for what you do for us every day and for the Word of God and for an opportunity to communicate it and uh, study it and learn it and apply it and grow in grace and truth and grow in righteousness and grow in obedience to your spirit. And we ask that this uh, uh, message be blessed, uh, be, be a blessing for all those who will hear it, that it will edify them and uh, that it will edify the teacher as well. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you very much for listening. If we begin now with Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 and 20. Uh, verse 19 starts today today. Now this was written at a certain point in time, so today is any day you read it, right? Today I've given you the choice between life and death. That's today, June 29, 2015. It's today, back when somebody wrote that. It's today, back when somebody said that before anything was written. So today is the appropriate day for salvation. Today I've given you the choice between life and death. Uh, life and death, physical life, physical death, but especially spiritual life and spiritual death. Shalom and Ra. The, the, the possibility of living in the eternal presence of God or living absent from God, living without Him and living with the, 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 the grief and the loneliness of being without Him at, at, any, at any point of time or eternity. Uh, the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. So right away, right off the bat, life is blessings and uh, death is curses. Now, God really can only create and love and bless. That is what God does. Now, he allows other things to happen, and he's given man free will, so man is free to make choices other than to accept what God offers. But God really is a God of blessings. If we have curses, God will allow it, but it's because we choose to be cursed. Yeah. Now I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make, uh, the, the heavenly realm and, and uh, every every everybody on earth to witness the choice you make. Uh, and the choice you make, how, how will we uh, witness the choice you make? Well, it's, it's two things. It's a point in time when you say you choose life or you choose death, but then it's also the way you live or the way you walk, you know, after you've made the choice of life or death. If you choose spiritual death, you're going to walk one way. If you choose spiritual life, you're going to walk another way. And that walk is your witness. So yes, people may witness the moment in time when you make a decision, but more likely what they're going to witness in witnessing the choice that you make is whether you bear proper fruit. Whether you bear the Galatians 5.22 fruit is really what people are going to witness uh, uh, you know, as far as the choice you make. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. So you see, God is very much into the, the generational implications of the decisions that we make. And you know, I was recently uh, doing some study on uh, parents and children, and you know, uh, it's, it, it, you know, there are scriptural passages that talk about, you know, uh, a, a family being, you know, blessed for generations if people are, you know, walking with God, and cursed for generations if they're not walking with God. Uh, and, and we see some kind of uh, corroboration of this here. Oh, that you would choose life so that you and your descendants might live. Uh, so that there, there are implications for, you know, fathers and sons and mothers and daughters and, you know, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, etc., all the way down the line, up and down the line. You know, it's a, a number of generations can be affected by the decisions that you make. And uh, they talk... Uh, uh, people talk about breaking the generational curse, and with God all things are possible, but you know, once a generational curse has been set in motion, uh, it, it, do, it does take uh, extreme faith and extreme dedication to the Word of God to, uh, to build up the momentum to break that curse. You know, God will break a curse of any number of generations. With, as I say, with, with God all things are possible. But the, the, the more that that curse gets you know, entrenched and encrusted in the life of several generations of a family, obviously the more difficult it is to break that habit. And uh, it's, it's interesting when you get into, you know, families and generations and things that happen. And I, I've been uh, yeah, recently doing some, some writing of small, uh, small books, you know, on certain subjects. And one, one of them that I've, I've written on, 
um, recently is called Marriage and Family Issues, and I write about a lot of things. Uh, uh, children and parents is one of them. I, I write about uh, uh, marriage and uh, intimacy, and not not long things, but just you know, if you examine the appropriate scriptures, what can you draw from those scriptures? Uh, adultery, uh, divorce, and remarriage. Um, uh, things like that, all of those those uh, relational things um, that, that, that are very sensitive because they involve people who are very close to each other and uh, how people relate to each other when they're that close and how they relate to other people and how they relate to God, you know, all of that can, gets to be a very tricky situation. But uh, after, you know, years of study of different family issues that, are, that arise and that, that have arisen in my family, um, you know, I've uh, I've put together a short book, you know, to try to uh, to, to try to get people to think about uh, these issues in, in in a godly way. Because I think if you examine the different scriptures in these areas, I don't think it's really possible that everybody is going to agree what the what uh, the Bible says about divorce and remarriage, for example. Uh, it, depending how you understand the scriptures, uh, there are going to be conflicting interpretations of what really the what really the Bible means. The thing is, you have to get into the mindset of a relationship with God and let the Spirit guide your steps, you know, guide your paths. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's both, what I'm trying to do is to help people examine the scriptures more closely in those areas, but also uh, bearing in mind the, 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 the difficulty of, uh, of, of reaching some common agreement, what every scripture says and what it means, I think you need to develop an, uh, your own prayerful relationship uh, with God and let the Spirit minister to you in some of these different areas, especially in so, such a sensitive uh, uh, topic as, you know, family relations. But, but, but anyway, that's, I just wanted to digress to say that, there, that I'm, I'm starting to write some small booklets on some of these uh, topics. I have a few others on other topics, but uh, since we were uh, mentioning uh, family, I just, uh, that, that came to mind. and. Uh, and I just thought I'd mention it in passing. But so, uh, choose life so that you and your descendants might live. You can make this choice by loving the Lord your God. Uh, so you choose life by loving, by obeying Him. You choose life by obeying Him and by committing yourself firmly to Him. So love, we, we've got a definition of life. We've got three components of life. You love, you obey, you commit. And, and that's life. That's really what, you know, in Western Christianity we call, you know, uh, born again and saved or being, you know, born again of the Spirit and sealed for eternity. It's the, it's the, it's the choice to live, you know, it's, it's the choice, you choose life instead of death, life in Christ Jesus instead of death in being without Christ Jesus. So, so that's really, those are the key components. Uh, if you desire eternal life and really to start living in eternal life, you love, you obey, you commit. And of course you make the first decision that you believe uh, in uh, uh, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, that uh, he did show us the, the fullness of this victory that we have over sin and death. And so love, obey, and commit, this is the key to your life. And if you love and obey the Lord, you will live long in the land. The Lord swore to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So. The key to a long life is obedience. Now, uh, we often wonder, you know, why does someone live a long life and another person doesn't? And sometimes, you know, is it that they obeyed God or one, you know, the one who lived long always obeyed God and the one who didn't uh, live long didn't obey God? I can't say that I've really tried to make a study of this or to follow it in the lives of people that I know, but God is giving you the key here is that the more you are in tune with the Spirit and obedient to the Spirit, and obeying the Spirit, uh, the, the, the more it is that you're going to live the days that God has given you. God has given you a number of days, and the more likely it is you'll have the fullness of those days if you are obedient. And the number of days that he gives, you know, it's his decision how many, how many days you're going to get. But we're all given a number of days, and sometimes we look at a situation and we say, well, that's not fair. You know, people get different numbers of days, but who are we to question? This is the sovereign decision of God. And all we can do is live in the fullness of those days or make decisions where that take away some of those days because we're not living in the full obedience that, that God uh, wants us to live in. So anyway, that's a little bit about choosing life. And uh, th there are a number of scriptures that, uh, that, that, that uh, relate to this topic. And they all, in one way, they all have to do uh, with healing and health, you know, leading to peace and prosperity. So if you choose life, you're choosing a life of healing and health. And we tend to think of this in the physical realm, but really healing and health is in the physical, it's in the mental, it's in the emotional, it's in the spiritual. It's in every realm of life, healing and health. And that's what leads to peace and prosperity. 
prosperity, and that's that that concept of shalom. And if you take the opposite of healing and health, if you take uh, you know illness in the different realms, then that gives you the ra. That gives you what's the opposite of, of shalom. Uh, and so uh, th there are a number of scriptures that, that deal with uh, healing, and uh, you can understand that again. You can understand it in the natural, you can understand it in the spiritual. Uh, that's the thing about the, the Bible, is that you know biblical interpretation really is, it's, it's both literal and it is spiritual. You know, there are certain uh, stories and metaphors and allegories that give us principles to follow. And then there are some literal things that, you know, you just understand the words the way they are. But it's like anything else. If you limit yourself to one, you, you're missing the other. So you really have to look, when you study the Word of God, you have to look at, yes, the, the words and what the words say, uh, in, you know, in their normal meaning, you know, what they say. And then what else is there that, you know, that is maybe not, uh, it's not, uh, something that you can imagine literally, but it might be a symbol of something that teaches you something. So you've got, you've got th those are the two, basically the two ways to, to, to look at the, inter the or interpret the Word of God, to study and learn about the Word of God. So if you want healing, uh, there are a number of passages that have been given. I'll give you a few and then we'll go and we'll, we'll read a couple of the longer ones and, and then we'll close. But uh, you could look at 2 Kings 28. You could look at Psalm Psalms 6, 2, and 41, 3, and Isaiah 57, 19. So those are four passages right there that will get you started if you want to start looking at uh, healing and health uh, as, as part of choosing life over choosing death. Because what, what is the Word of, of God? It's the story of the restoration of the relationship between God and man. So saying that because of what happened in the garden, it became an unhealthy relationship, little by little God restores it. So yes, he restores it in the physical realm, and yes, it, it is, we, we can understand this in, for example, you know, I got a bad medical report and I want to be healed. You know, that's, that certainly is part of the healing. But it's also, a, you know, a, a mental thing and a spiritual thing and a, and a lifestyle thing and, you know, the way, the way you treat other people thing. You know, do you really have healthy relationships with people? That type, that type of thing. So it's healing and health across the board. And we tend to limit that discussion to uh, physical health. And I, I have an ailment and I want to be healed of the ailment. And, you know, then somebody comes along and says, well, I'm a healer, I'm a supernatural healer, and I can touch you and you'll be healed. And then uh, uh, all of a sudden someone else comes along and says, uh, uh, you have this problem and uh, uh, now you're not going to have this, this problem. I can see that disappearing. And, uh, you know, the person seems to know everything about what you have. And then, uh, and then you see that that person is wearing a microphone in their ear and getting the information from someone else. You know, I mean, so we, we kind of, we, 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 we take a very superficial, one-dimensional uh, approach to the subject, and then we distort it sometimes, you know. So, so really, uh, healing and health in every way you can imagine it. That's that's what we're talking about in the in the realm of the Word of God. So, uh, let's go to Matthew chapter ten, and I'll read verses one through eight. We'll get a little bit a little bit more on healing and health. Uh, this is uh, Jesus sending out the twelve apostles. Uh, Jesus called uh, his twelve disciples together. They were apostles and disciples, and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits. So he, he taught them. He, he taught them and he said, you, you have the authority to do this. By faith you can do this. You can cast out evil spirits. Uh, you, can, you can help people get rid of those demons in their thinking, you know, because this is really the evil spirit is especially, uh, um, you know, wicked thoughts and, uh, you know, things that torment you. The, the things that we've all, at different points in our lives, we've been tormented by different thoughts. Jesus gave authority to his 12 people to cast out these evil spirits and to heal every kind of disease and illness. So starting with physical, but not limited to physical. And here are the names of the 12 apostles, Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, and they take great pains to tell you that he was a tax collector, James, another James, Thaddeus, another Simon, also known as the Zealot, and then Judas Iscariot, who later betrayed Jesus. So these were the 12 apostles, and then replaced, uh, Judas was replaced by Paul. And Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions, don't go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Now, why was that? Why go just to Jewish people? Well, that, that, was, that was Jesus' ministry. Now, there were others who came along and ministered to the Gentiles, but really the way things happened historically was that... Uh, Jesus designated, or God uh, designated, 
the Jewish nation to uh, spread the good news to uh, the, all the other nations. And as you know, in the, in, uh, towards the end of the Old Testament times, really the nation turned away. It went into uh, idol worship and that sort of thing. So that job was not completed. So the next stage of the plan then became show mercy to the Gentiles. And then now, later on, uh, God is coming back and showing mercy to his, his people. So right now there's an opportunity for Jewish and non-Jewish to be unified in faith and to tell everybody else, you know, who has not believed in Christ, you know, to, to do this, to share the good news with everyone. But that, that's the way it was. It was supposed to be the, the Jewish nation, you know, having this responsibility of, uh, of witnessing to the good news to all the nations, and then that, that was not fulfilled. So then mercy to the Gentiles and now back to the mercy to the chosen people. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of heaven is near. The kingdom of heaven is near. So that's, that's the, the word of God that's living in the eternal presence of God, even on planet earth. The kingdom of heaven is near. Well, the kingdom of heaven, if you believed, it's within you. And it's near. It's anyway. It's not, it's not a million miles in the sky. I mean, it, it is everywhere. But I mean, people are looking up, you know, and saying, you know, come down, kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is teaching that, you know, it, the kingdom of heaven is near, right? It's, it's, it's everywhere. You can look up a million miles and the kingdom of heaven will be there as well. But, but start by faith in Christ. Start believing that the kingdom of heaven is inside of you. The good news is inside of you. You're made in God's image and sealed for eternity and you can share the good news with others. Share the good news of victory over sin and death with others. That's the kingdom of heaven living in God's presence. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. So these are kind of instructions to his main teachers. I mean, he's the number one teacher and he's assembling his team of teachers and they're going to fan out and they're going to teach the good news. And the good news is heal the sick. So you're healed. You're, be healed by your faith. You know, Jesus said that, be healed by your faith. Heal the sick, and this can be every type of sick, sickness. Raise the dead, that could be spiritually dead, and I, I tend to think, yes, you know, Jesus can raise from the dead physically. I'm not discounting that, but I'm saying raise the dead is the people who are dead spiritually. Help them arise spiritually by faith. I mean, look, look at it a little bit more as, you know, presto, and the person that was dead physically is now alive. I'm not discounting that. I'm not telling you not to believe that. I'm not telling you it didn't happen and couldn't happen. But what I'm saying is take it a little bit further. You know, don't limit yourself to this one-dimensional interpretation of the word. You know, it's a, it's a spiritual concept as well. Cure those with leprosy. Uh, leprosy... Uh, you know, any it's it's a it's a skin disease. It's a very contagious d disease, and and it could be there is such a thing as well. Even you can take that one a little further. Spiritual leprosy, right? You know, it's this this contagious disease of lack of faith. It's a contagious skin disease, but it's also a contagious disease of lack of faith. And cast out demons. Get rid of those antichrist thoughts. Get rid of those anti kingdom of God thoughts. Give as freely as you're received. Give in all realms. It doesn't say tithe. It says give. So, so give what you have. Give what you have to give as freely as you have received. If God has been generous with you, and I'm sure he has, then be generous. Just be a generous giver, you know, and uh, don't, don't worry so much about the tithing. You know, last night we were, we were uh, uh, as, you know, somebody used to joke, committing the impardonable, the unpardonable sin of watching Christian TV, but, uh, that, and that's a joke, but, uh, Somebody was, you know, one of the Christian pastors we were watching with uh, an extremely shiny bald head was teaching about tithing, and uh, it, it really, it, it was. It, he may have just been holding up a sign. It would have been just as easy to hold up a sign and say, "Give me ten percent of your income." I mean, and, and the way he was teaching it, it was, it was so clear that it was not. You weren't giving anything to God. I mean, is, are, are we thinking God is going to come walking down the aisle and say, "Give it to me, give it to me, I'll use it"? No, you're giving the money to the pastor and hoping that the pastor will use it for godly purposes. And I always, it always kind of cracks me up. This business about tithing is that you know Christian pastors love to say we're not under the law, but for tithing, it's okay to be under the law. And I know that tithing was done before the law, but it was also part of the law. But uh, in this one area, this seems to be the one area where Christian pastors seem to think that, you know, for everything else, don't be under the law. But in this one area, don't touch the tithe, brother. And uh, so I, I think that, uh, I, I, I don't know, I just, uh, it, it's funny in a way, but, you know, it can be, it can also be sad in a way. But I mean, it, 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 Jesus isn't saying to, to tithe. What Jesus says about tithing, yeah, he tithed. And he said, don't forget tithing, because it was still part of what they were under. But what he's saying is, give as freely as you've received. 
and he said he said other things too, like don't don't take any money in your money belts, no gold, no silver, or even copper coins. You know, they kind of get to the, they're going to distract you and be heavy, and you know you're, you you want to you want to go in uh, faith, right? And that's part of your healing is to develop your faith. Don't carry a traveler's bag, no traveler's checks, with no change of clothes and sandals, or even a walking stick. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality, right? Because those who work deserve to be fed. So Jesus is very honest about that. Is that you know, you know we're doing an honest day's work, and when people give graciously, accept it. And a lot, a lot of people, and it's kind of a bit legalistic and arrogant. A lot of people, they're they're very giving for whatever their motivation is. But when you want, you want to give them something, there's this guilt that comes over them. You know, well, maybe I can't receive this. Maybe I shouldn't accept this. And I think, you know, why not? You know, I mean, if the person wants to give you something, you don't want to be a sponger, you don't want to be a moocher, but I mean, at the same time, uh, I, I think part of giving and, and receiving is that you give and you receive. And if you give with the right heart, then someone will give to you and you can receive. You can, you, you can receive with no guilt or condemnation. You gave with the right heart and God knows your heart. So we'll do uh, one more, and that'll be uh, John Four and forty-two to fifty-four. So this is uh, this is more about healing. And again, this was this is uh, this this is physical healing. But we can get into a, 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 you know, a couple of other things as well. Then they said to the woman, "Now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we've heard him ourselves. We've heard Jesus talk about healing. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior." of the world. So he's come to give us the good news and the Savior in that sense. Uh, he's, uh, he, and you know, he's, he is the Messiah who is going to go to the cross and in that way he will be Savior, but he's also Savior in, in the sense that he's, give, he's told us the good news. He's told us about the good news and he's told us that we can have the kingdom of heaven by faith. At the end of the two days, Jesus went on to Galilee. He himself had said that a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. So what does he do? He goes to his own hometown. You know, this is sometimes you have to walk into that flame, you know, that uh, you have to walk into the fire, you have to walk into the, the jaws of the, the lion, you know, the lion's den <coughs> or the pit, because that's what you have to do. And, uh, you know, and, and, you know, maybe you go off somewhere for a while and then you come home and you, you're faced with some kind of a difficult situation and, you know, but you went home, you know, and you have to, you have to face that, you know, that's, that's it. That's what God wanted for you. Go home and face what there is, you know, and deal with it. Yet the Galileans welcomed him, for they had been in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration and had seen everything he did there. So he wasn't supposed to be able to go home, but he got this surprise that when he went home, you know, they actually welcomed him. As he traveled through Galilee, he came to Cana, where he had turned the water into wine. There was a government official in nearby Capernaum, whose son was very sick. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged Jesus to come to Capernaum to heal his son, who was about to die. And uh, Jesus asked, will you never believe in me unless you see miraculous signs and wonders? And this is the, this is the thing. I mean, do you do you view me as kind of a nightclub act, or you know, someone who comes to birthday parties and does magic tricks? I mean, is that is this how you see faith? You know, if I if I perform some miracle, that's the way you'll believe. And I think this is a big challenge to us, is uh, uh, because you know we 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 tend to see miracles in that way. It's like a trick, and really, a m miracles uh, th there are miracles, but in a way, if we had enough faith. Miracles would be ordinary. It's the, the miracles are supernatural and extraordinary because we don't have that level of faith to comprehend them and to believe them. You know that's that's why they're miracles. You know if somebody is raised from the dead, I mean, that's a miracle. But it's it's because we don't completely understand uh, faith that you know a lot of these supernatural things. You know we we call them miracles. But so Jesus is challenging people here to to think about their faith and really you know if they had more faith then the miraculous would be ordinary right you know it wouldn't you, you wouldn't have uh, you, you wouldn't uh, have to you know ask for for miracles and and do you only believe in me because you think you're going to get some miracle or wonder the official pleaded lord please come now before my little boy dies you know i got a kid dying here and you're trying to lecture me about things right so uh, Jesus told him, go back home, your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said and started home. So Jesus prayed and believed by faith and, you know, told, told the man, you know, yes, I can cure, I can heal. You know, God has that curative power if you believe. 
and you know I, I can pray and your son will be healed go back home your son will live and the man believed what Jesus said and started home while the man was on his way some of his servants met him with the news that his son was alive and well he asked them when the boy had begun to get better and they replied yesterday afternoon at one o'clock his fever suddenly disappeared then the father realized that that was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. So there's Jesus connected to the father and able to perform supernatural miracles. And the more faith we have, the more miracles we will have, the more health we will have, the more healing we will have, the more prosperity we will have. But it has to do with building the faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You hear the word of God, you live the word of God, your faith develops, and what you thought was a miracle before, it becomes natural, it becomes the most natural thing in the world. And you have more and more, you know, greater and greater degrees of shalom. The shalom goes up and the ra goes down. You've got the peace and prosperity of God. You've got the kingdom, and you can share the kingdom. You've got the good news. That's, that's really what it is, uh, lived out. You know, the kingdom is really salvation living. It's not the decision to believe in Jesus Christ. It's you believed in Jesus Christ. Now, salvation living, living in the eternal presence of God, even here on earth, that's the kingdom. So it's, it's, it's the living part of the salvation. It's the, the, there's the believing in Christ, and then the kingdom is the living part of it. Then the father realized that this was the very time Jesus had told him, your son will live. And he is, and his entire household believed in Jesus. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus did in Galilee after coming from Judea. So Jesus healed. So he, he, he provides health. He is the healer. He provides health. He provides healing. He provides these miracles. And the more faith you have, the less that these really seem like miracles. It seems like just the product of faith. You have faith and you believe and so things happen, right? So anyway, that's a little bit of, of what it means to choose life. It's to love, to obey, to commit. And it is really to be healed and to have health, which really means to have peace and prosperity, the peace of God that passes all understanding. So I'll stop there, and uh, I would just like to uh, you know, invite you to study some of these scriptures and think about them, meditate about them, and, and believe on them and apply them to your lives and, uh, and see what happens. Father, we'd just like to thank you again for another chance to be in the Word. And we ask that this uh, message will be a blessing to those who will hear it. And we thank you for all the things that you do for us every day, all of the uh, miracles and all of the acts of healing and health and prosperity that you have available uh, to give us uh, when we believe in them and believe in, in you and uh, in your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Betsy.